Welcome to CFRI Cystic Fibrosis Community Voices, a video podcast series created by and for the cystic fibrosis community. Hello, everyone. I'm Siri Vaith, Executive Director of CFRI, and I welcome you to our CF Community Voices podcast. Thank you for joining us. We are in the midst of a pandemic and it is an extraordinarily stressful time for all. So before we move forward, I do wanna encourage people to go to our website at cfri.org to see the many services and resources we have um, to help us all cope with these challenging times. Also, because we are still in the midst of a pandemic, we are recording this from our homes where we are still sheltering. Uh, So in advance, I ask forgiveness for any background noise, particularly um, from my my home setting. (laughs) Um, So in light of the stress that we're all facing, I'm extraordinarily delighted uh, to welcome today's speaker, um, whose personal story is so incredibly inspiring. Um, Before I introduce her, I do want to remind everybody that nothing that is shared today should be used to make any changes in your medical regimen. And prior to making any changes, please consult with your healthcare team. And I also want to thank our sponsors of this podcast, Kiesi USA, Beatrice, and Genentech. So now, on to the presentation, Imagining the Impossible, Holding the Miracle. It is my pleasure to introduce Luann McKinnon. Luann is 65 years old and living with cystic fibrosis. And now she's nearly 10 years post-transplant. Diagnosed at age 14 after a long series of misdiagnoses, she has realized many dreams and goals through the extraordinary advances in CF care. Luann holds a Master of Fine Arts in Painting and a PhD in Art History, specializing in the work of Pablo Picasso. She's realized ownership of a private art dealership in New York City, has served extensively as an art museum director and curator, and as a university professor of art history, both in the United States and in Scotland. Luann is an acclaimed artist herself and has lectured and been published widely in the world of visual arts. In service to the CF and transplant communities, Luann has served as the first co-chair of the Patient and Family Advisory Council for Lung and Heart-Lung Transplants at Stanford, where she oversaw many patient-oriented initiatives. She and her husband, Daniel, currently reside in the beautiful foothills of the California Sierras, and also, lucky for her, in the southwestern region of France. Uh, And this April 4th marks 10 years with her new lungs, such great news. So I welcome you, Luann. Thank you so much, Siri. It's my true pleasure to have been invited by your team at CFRI to participate today and to share my, what I like to call my little story. So um, I would like to uh, share with you a piece that I wrote for an education day at Stanford. And it is entitled, Imagining the Impossible, Holding the Miracle. This is a story that is now over 50 years in the making. In my own way, I have tried to live above a life with cystic fibrosis as abundantly as possible. Many times over the years, however, its effects have rendered me in terrible states leading to a true uncertainty about my future. I have given my years of survival much thought and practice. And to the best of my understanding, everything to the United States and Stanford and Scotland, it has everything to do with divine grace that gave me courage. It has everything to do with discipline and a sense of humor and an appreciation for irony and the magic of imagination and so much love. Needing new lungs is arduous at best and at times it was pretty unbearable. But for so many of us who share this journey and for those of us who may be facing it or for family members or those affected by cystic fibrosis in myriad ways, I hope today that my little story finds resonance in your hearts and minds. An antidote to the trauma of a life-threatening illness has been my devotion to beauty in all forms. I recognized this early on in myself. The American author Willa Cather wrote, 
success is never so interesting as struggle. And I think she meant that we learn so much more about ourselves when we are in a struggle or, or having difficulty. We are tested as to what we are made of and how we will react. We may surprise one another, but we must, may surprise ourselves at how strong we are and wise. This challenge has certainly shaped me. And because we are experts at survivors, we may give back to others, even if it is just one person who is suffering, or if it is just ourselves, and we can imagine and make our futures according to how well we dream within the scope of our lives. I believe this. In my life, I came to think that hope existed in the not knowing, strangely enough. I remained hopeful because I could not know what would happen to my challenge. And so I imagined sure big scenarios and also none at all. But isn't it the case that we work with hope through our imaginations of what could be and then what is? Science is based on testing the imagination, the laboratory of probabilities of the potential what ifs. And groundbreaking trials lead medical science toward life-saving strategies, many of which we benefit from. We are now living through this to the maximum in these times of COVID. But most of all, I think of my trials and my triumphs as nothing more or less than a miraculous love story. Until recently, I had not considered the metaphorical possibility of this old photograph taken of me 62 years ago, posed to look at my mother across the room and in that setting against a large studio mirror, my profile doubled my loving gaze at her. The photo now catches my imagination because the two me's are bracketed by the reality since 2011 of two me's, the one before and after the double lung transplant. I now see in this little photograph, the mystery of my very long journey, looking back and looking forward. But turning back 52 years ago to 1969, I, was, I had continual coughing spasms and rattle box wheezing fits that lasted forever. At the age of 14, we were told to rush to Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas. Exit Walnut Hill, I remember my parents repeating to one another during the drive to the hospital on very crowded Central Expressway. I spent the Christmas period there and over two weeks, many, many tests were conducted. I lived in an oxygen tent and peered through the mist, of the, the mist of the aluminum Christmas tree that my mother had installed in the corner of my room in the pediatrics floor. Soon enough, the chloride sweat tests were conclusive and I was diagnosed with an odd sounding problem, cystic fibrosis. What in the world? My parents were informed that there was no cure and they were advised not to expect much of me. At the time, there were no campaigns to kiss your baby for saltiness that swept the country in the 1980s, like on bus ads across the country. No routine to test parents who might be CF carriers, no real medications that might address the disease rather than merely the symptoms. No genome project or pharmacological breakthroughs for help. So to fear this thing that doctors could not heal registered heavily with my parents, especially my mom. Family lore had oft repeated that her only sister, Catherine, laid on her bed and starved and coughed to death. She died on her birthday in 1931. Her new red bicycle swathed in a large white bow and parked by the barn was never ridden. Catherine was 20. I know that she had to have had cystic fibrosis for which there was absolutely nothing to ease her symptoms. The disease had no name in 1931. 
And so in 69, my Dallas doctors explained to my parents that if I were fortunate enough, fortunate enough, I could survive to the age of 19. To set this in context, in my little world of clarinet practice and private painting lessons, I was naive about the real world, except from what I saw on television. Against the reality of my diagnosis and a new family dynamic that was fraught at best given my life sentence, I watched the throng of half a million kids at Yasker's farm for the rock festival protest Woodstock and was amazed and felt so far from them. This was an event that I knew I could never participate in given my health. I saw news reports about the war in Vietnam, which I could not comprehend given the overt cowboy football shopping mall culture of Dallas. My own far in the future husband to be, Daniel Reeves, would enlist in the Marines at age 17 and was shipped out on the USS Henrico crossing the Pacific and turning 18 en route to battle. The Beatles released Come Together in 69 with John Lennon singing, one thing I can tell you is you got to be free. It resonated as an anti-war, anti-hate song, which my youth church group sang. And there were other songs that we sang too as well. Color in sky, brush and blue. Scarlet fleece changes hue. Crimson ball sinks from view. But above other news in 69, man had landed on the moon. Every television set on the planet broadcast the fuzzy NASA pictures that roused worldwide glee and astonishment. But for reasons buried in my subconscious until April 4th, 2011, the triumph of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walking on the moon became a metaphor for my journey and breathing, for facing the impossible, or so I thought. On that April day, the date of my lung transplant, the image of a solid, solitary astronaut standing on the moon came to me in a vision like a good omen as I was wheeled towards surgery. But to backtrack a little bit, I not only lived to be 19, I committed myself to envisioning a big future. I went to college in Europe, in Rome, in 1975. Even with CF, even with cystic fibrosis, I told myself everything still seemed possible. The freedom that I felt that very year, the year I was to have expired, to have died, was exhilarating. I could do this. I would not fear, I told myself. Traveling once classes had concluded each week, I packed chest x-rays I was instructed to have with me at all times, a clunky DeVilbis 35B nebulizer, saline packets and glass vials of mucum mist. I hauled that stuff in a duffel bag and headed out of Rome's train station for Tuscany, the Rhine River, Delft country in Amsterdam, the ancient theater at Delphi near the temple of Apollo and to Paris, of course. I obeyed my nebulizer routine to a T. I boiled ordinary tap water on a little hot plate to sterilize the neb components. Traveling from country to country, 
where electric currents changed and outlet plugs differed wildly, I brought a wardrobe of AC-DC adapters as if they were language translators. Like all pulmonary patients who are experts at their care, 46 years ago, the one tool I had, my machine, as I called it, was all that could be relied upon. But I was excited. I was so excited. Yes, I was sick sometime, but I felt that if I lived to the best of my instincts and I followed the pulmonary regime and I took my pancreatic enzymes, that if I imagined that I could do and be in this world and not be defined as a sick girl, then somehow, and hopefully most of the time, I would not be. Certainly hospitalizations continued in the years that followed. Countless procedures, an infinite number of IVs, blood draws, x-rays, surgeries, a tracheotomy, pulmonary drainage, lung hemorrhages, collapsed lungs, tubes and more tubes, gastro and sinus nightmares, new and good drugs, DNAs, for example, and challenging drugs like prednisone, new equipment and instructions for home use, portable oxygen in every shape and size, respiratory therapy in the oddest places, airport lounges at a friend's house, once in New York, I mounted a slanting pulmonary drainage board on a desk that overlooked Macy's headquarters and then the new threats of Pseudomonas and MRSA. Decades would pass. I turned 19, then 29, 39, 49, and 59. My decline in health preceded the advent of the miracle of Trichafta. I was happily married to Daniel Reeves in a beautiful ceremony in Scotland in 2001. We then moved to our home in France and returned to the United States in 2005. I became a museum director at Rollins College in Florida and thereafter at the University of New Mexico Art Museum in Albuquerque. And my resume included over 30 exhibitions, a dozen publications, and I oversaw the building of both of those institutions. I was approaching end-stage lung disease by 2009, even as I worked full-time in overdrive. In 2010, Daniel and I were informed of the option of a double, double lung transplant by my team at the University of New Mexico. Now in this photo here, taken of me crossing into Arizona, I had already had a tracheotomy that put an oxygen tube directly into my lungs. And so I'm not wearing a nasal cannula. And this device allowed me to have a higher capacity of air that didn't go through the, the nasal uh, cavities. So that's why you see me here, uh, seemingly off oxygen, but I definitely was on oxygen. <laughs> the idea of a double lung transplant was an impossible idea for us to face. I had always referred to transplant as the T, therefore not granting it a name, keeping it at a distance, keeping it foreign. I was certain that I would thrive on my own as I was, a crazy idea, since I was later told that I was in a cadaveric state. The transplant, if there was to be one, was my only chance. But I truly wondered, was luck on my side? I was the first person from New Mexico that was sent to Stanford. As we were told, quote, they have a very good reputation, unquote. Well, it was a giant understatement. Down to 84 pounds with dropping O2 levels. We hit the road, driving from Albuquerque across the desert to Palo Alto in 2010. I was soon listed at Stanford Medical Center for a transplant, and we moved to San Francisco to wait. This was not our home, but through my ritual of staring out the window at the Golden Gate Bridge and Daniel playing ball with our Labrador Maya and walks with our dear friend, Sean, daily, 
plus my talks with two close friends who kept hundreds of people informed about my state of being nine months past by. I had two false runs for surgery, and I was later told that 24 possible donor lung matches had my name on them and then were passed over for one precise reason or another. Then finally, the donor match came. And I have to say, in all my life, I felt that time had stopped. That moment, the very instant when one learns that there is a potential perfect match is that moment when someone has died. And for me, that was an infinitely complex reality to grasp. And I'm still working on the extraordinariness of it, an exchange of lives, so to speak. My call to surgery came at 6 a.m. on April 4th, 2011. I was already hospitalized at Stanford due to my decline. Late that day, I was whisked down toward my future. New lungs, my lungs, had been flown in from an undisclosed place. I traveled the hall to surgery with my little band of loved ones. We passed no other patients, no other medical staff, no one, as if we were in a silent solo performance. The great Pacific sun was setting on the gleaming walls and on me. Its warmth was a palpable reassurance. If it were to be the last thing I knew of this life, it was a good and benevolent gift. I was wheeled to the entry of the surgical unit and we slowed down before making the turn. I gave Daniel a final knowing look. Do not worry, sweetheart. I needed to convey this to him. Once inside the doors, I raised my two very skinny arms in a triumphant gesture. This time, this place. Uncannily, the men on the moon came to mind. In Houston in 1969, NASA had broadcast to the astronauts who had not yet landed the Eagle saying, Apollo 11, 30 seconds of fuel remaining. As it was, I didn't have much fuel either. But I thought as we made a wrong turn, passing by the large stainless steel table of sur surgical saws and knives that gave me the biggest scare of my life. Oh, well, never mind, I thought. I will suit up like the astronauts and go somewhere that few people go and I will enter a realm unknown to me and I will survive and come back to this beautiful earthly plane. I will be on a journey that could save my life. There is no dimension to this very brief vision. In a state of free flowing and not knowing, the seemingly impossible was overcome as my body began to hold the miracle of new lungs. I would survive despite the ordeal of what my surgeon, Dr. Harry Malladay told Daniel was something like, quote, being hit head on by a Mack truck. The state of coming out of transplant surgery remains to this day, one of the hardest things to describe, but I can say that I knew I had come through it and I was aware that the physical trauma of the operation would be incalculable for some time. And it was despite the extraordinary care that I was provided in all ways. In my case, an incredible medical team managed the mechanics of the surgery. And, and the top row of surgeons, my surgeon, my head surgeon was Dr. Harry Malady. And the other three doctors were on my medical team. Uh, the search for my lungs and the management, the administration and the coordination of my lungs was organized by the great Dr. Weil, who's at the top right. And then on day two, I somehow managed to walk and here I am with my brother who flew in to help me. And Daniel is the photographer here. 
<laughs> One afternoon, it slipped out that the surgeon who was checking on me mentioned flying to procure my lungs from an anonymous donor and bringing them back to Stanford, secured in a blue Tupperware carrier of all things. I gasped. We both knew at that moment that he had revealed a fact that was to be kept a secret, but I cajoled him into having a picture made, explaining that I was a writer and that it would figure into my story one day. And so it has. My heroes are many and they are the main characters in this love story, which is magnified by the life-saving gift from a stranger whose name and age and the facts of their life I will never know. To this day, the most humbling and vexing question I ponder about my donor is, what life did they leave behind? For this I'm deeply sorrowful, and yet, as with all of us who hold the lungs or organs of another, we are bound in the realms of perfect time and place and person-to-person -person life saving possibilities that are ours. The lesson for me then is that of the beneficence of strangers. First and foremost, my donor as a stranger whose lungs I hold, whose lungs allow me to, to speak, to laugh, to sing, to walk, to get on the treadmill, to get up in the morning, to take care, to drive the car, to go up a step. There are many other strangers or unknown people too. I often thought, who fueled the helicopter to obtain the lungs? Who flagged the pilot and surgeon to safety, safely land at the other hospital and look ahead at air traffic and weather reports? Who transported the lungs and cared for them before the surgery? And then there are the countless numbers of other people at Stanford who took care of every possible aspect of my body and spirit and its needs during my 31 day recovery and for close to 10 years since. But above all, a stranger saved my life. Isn't this the most stunning call for non-divisiveness in our human world? Can we take this lesson for adaptation against all prejudice and limitations? This unerring miracle of fate and science opens the door of the heart for boundless gratitude for the simplest and most complex of things. And truly, this is the core of the love story. I believe that the transformation from being near dead to newly alive is not merely physical. This is the realm of the metaphysical, metaphysical that is asked of me, who am I now? Here then has been my opportunity to embrace the miraculous yes of this life and to understand the infinite connections that all of us share, indisputably. I recently met a man next to me on a short plane trip pre-COVID. He was charming and it turns out that he was a national figure in the science of AIDS and the aging. We had a lively exchange and he learned about my history as a transplant patient. He had lost thousands of patients in his work to cure AIDS over the decades. And upon departing the plane, he turned from me, to me from the queue we were in to exit and said straight on and quite frankly, you know, survivors are like teachers. They affect eternity. I have tried to reach a few personal goals in my life since the transplant and before the transplant. I have tried to engender compassion for all living things in my path and to love and care for my husband, my family and friends and to celebrate nature and beauty. And in this photo, those are cherries that I harvested from our a tree here and sunflowers from our place in France and berries on the vine and a birthday and my our two lovely beautiful graduates in our family uh, so this this is a very happy love collage
I'm devoted to wearing my mask, and I always have been. I'm devoted to taking my meds on time each day. I'm devoted to pump some iron and do it again. And then, because I have new lungs, I can take a walk in the light. And here I am with my 89-year-old dad in the California Redwoods. In service to our community and in everlasting honor of my donor, with thanks beyond measure to Daniel, my family and dear friends and caregivers, to my Stanford medical team, to all those who worked tirelessly to find a cure for cystic fibrosis, and to all of you who are tuned in today, I am simply Luann McKinnon. Thank you so much for listening. Luann, Luann, that was phenomenal. I am so moved by, um, well, I'm of course moved by the whole, but the unbelievable pearls of wisdom, um, mm. just incredible gems. I look forward to watching this, the recording later and just extracting these pearls. Um, mm. Really so many lessons to live by. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That was beautiful. And I also can tell you're an artist just by virtue of everything you shared, the way it was put together, but even, you know, the selection of photos, just so beautiful how they conveyed your message. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.